oftentimes when we want to uh, write down um, an atom, we like to be able to write it in a way that we can see um, how many neutrons and protons uh, the atom has. And this is how we do it. When we write down an element um, with this atomic nomenclature, first we put the letter that represents the atomic symbol. And then in the lower left corner, we put the atomic number. In other words, that's what we refer to as Z. And in the upper left corner, we put the atomic mass number, A. So for example, um, oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons in its most common form. So we would write that this way. So it has 16 protons plus neutrons, and it has eight protons. Another example would be carbon. So carbon-12 is the standard form of carbon. And again, that has six protons, and it has uh, 12 protons plus neutrons. And obviously, if you wanted to just figure out the number of neutrons, you would take the atomic mass number and subtract the atomic number. So for example, up here for uranium, uranium has 238 protons plus neutrons. It has 92 protons. So the number of uh, neutrons in uranium would be 146. You'll notice that on the last slide I was saying the most common form of carbon or the most common form of oxygen. And that's because um, atoms of the same element can have different numbers of neutrons. Remember that it's the number of protons that determines the element. So in other words, carbon always has carbon always has six protons. But it turns out it doesn't necessarily always have six neutrons. So atoms that have the same um, uh, or atoms of the same element that contain different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes. So let's look at an example. It turns out the most common form of hydrogen just has uh, one proton and no neutrons at all. Um, we can also have hydrogen that has one neutron or two neutrons in the nucleus. So those are referred to as isotopes. They all would behave the same way chemically. Some of the hydrogen that is in your body right now is one of these other isotopes. It's not all um, the standard form. Uh, here's another example which is carbon. And again, carbon-12 is by far the most common uh, uh, isotope of carbon. And uh, it has six protons and six neutrons. But there are other ones as well, such as carbon-13 or carbon-14. And again, each of those simply have one or two additional neutrons. Let's talk about atomic mass. And actually, before I do that, um, I want to just point out that there's something that's very confusing here, which is that the terms, three different terms, all sound almost the same. We talked about atomic number. And remember, atomic number is represented by the letter Z, and that's the number of protons. We've also talked about atomic mass number. which we've represented by the letter A, and that's the number of nucleons, protons plus neutrons. And now we have a third thing, atomic mass. Well, atomic mass is simply the mass of the atom. So the total mass of the protons, neutrons, and electrons that make up an atom. Atomic mass is not measured in kilograms. It's measured in atomic mass units. And uh, atomic mass units can be related, related to kilograms. One atomic mass unit is 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. 
And you can see why we don't use kilograms when we're dealing with the mass of atoms because the mass is so small compared to the mass of a kilogram. Uh, when you look on the periodic table, uh, depending on the periodic table, if it has more than the atomic number, which again is that number there, uh, it will generally have the atomic mass in atomic mass units. So the atomic mass of helium is 4.003. Okay. So definitely make sure that you have these three terms straight in your mind. Atomic number, atomic mass number, and atomic mass. Um, the one thing to notice is those first two terms both have the phrase number in them, showing you that it means a number of something, like number of protons, number of nucleons. Whereas the last term, atomic mass, is a mass. Let's talk about um, how the electrons are organized in an atom. It turns out that electrons can only be in certain areas or be at certain energy levels inside an atom. And we refer to these areas or energy levels as electron shells. Electron shells uh, historically have been labeled in the following way. The inner shell is K, then L, M, N, O, P, and Q. So those are the different shells that electrons can be in. And as we go through the periodic table, uh, hydrogen, for example, would just have one electron in the K shell. Um, but the K shell can only hold up to two electrons. And so helium would have two in the K shell, but then the next element would start having electrons not only in the K shell, but in the L shell as well. Um, the maximum number of electrons that are allowed in a shell can actually be calculated from the following formula, uh, 2n squared, where n is the number of the shell. So just an exa as an example, if I want to figure out um, how many electrons can there be in the M shell, um, M is the third shell, so K is 1, L is 2, M is 3. So 2 times 3 squared, let's see, 3 times 3 is 9, 2 times 9 is 18. And so that's where these numbers come from in the diagram, which simply represent the maximum number of electrons in each shell. The next thing we want to talk about is electron binding energy. How strongly an electron is bound to the nucleus is called the electron binding energy. And electron binding energy is measured in electron volts, which is a unit of energy. And I just want to show you how that relates to the unit of energy we've talked about earlier in the course, which is the joule. Um, an electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. So again, it's a very small amount of energy, which is why we use a different unit. The important thing to understand about electron binding energy is that the farther away an electron is from the nucleus, the less tightly bound to the nucleus it is. And you can kind of understand why that is. Um, if you have a positive and a negative charge, the closer they are, the more attracted they are. And the farther apart they are, the less attracted they are. So electrons that are in higher level shells farther away from the nucleus, their um, electron binding energy will be less. In other words, it would take less energy to knock that electron out of that atom. So let's look at an example of how an electron can be knocked out of an atom. And one way that that can happen is when an x-ray hits an atom. And this is something we briefly talked about way back at the beginning of the course. This is what we mean by ionization. So ionizing radiation, if you remember, means radiation that can knock an electron out of an atom. And an x-ray can provide enough energy to ionize an atom. So again, in our diagram, here comes the x-ray in, and it takes this electron, and it knocks the electron out of the atom. Now, how this relates to binding energy, the binding energy is simply how much energy that x-ray has to be able to deliver to that electron to knock it out of the atom. So an outer electron in carbon um, has 
a binding energy of 34 electron volts, that means that the X-ray would have to provide 34 electron volts to knock that electron out of the atom. Now once that electron is knocked out of the atom, you'll notice that if this is carbon, and by the way, the, di the picture doesn't quite match carbon, but let's say it is, it's carbon that we're talking about. Remember that carbon normally would have six protons, and so normally it would have six electrons. Well, once it loses that electron, it only has five electrons. And so now the atom is no non longer neutral, but has a charge because it has one more proton than it does electrons. It would have a positive charge. We would refer to that as a positive ion. So on, when an electron gets knocked out of an atom, we now have a positive ion. What's left has a positive charge. So we've talked about the fact that um, electrons uh, can only be in these certain orbits or certain energy levels, which we call electron shells. The electrons that are in the outermost shell are called valence electrons. And the reason that uh, that's important is something we'll see here in just a minute. Um, so the number of electrons in the outermost shell is just equal to its group in the periodic table. So for example, hydrogen has one valence electron. It actually has one electron. That's it. Um, lithium also has one electron in its outer shell. And just to draw that, if this is the nucleus of the lithium atom, you can think of the fact that in that first shell, and if you remember back on the previous page we referred to that as the K shell, um, you can only have two electrons. So that first shell has two electrons, and then the next electron would be in the L shell. And so lithium would still only have one electron in that outer shell, one valence electron. And that would be true of every element in this group. And the reason that's important is that's why all of the atoms within a group have similar chemical behavior, because they have the same number of valence electrons in the outer shell. And it turns out that the number of valence electrons determines how one atom will interact with another. I wanted to talk briefly about compounds. Um, we're certainly not going to get into the chemistry of how atoms bind together to form molecules, um, but I want to just talk about it briefly. When different atoms bond together, they form a compound as opposed to an element, which is just one type of atoms. And uh, the smallest unit of a compound is a molecule. So for example, um, if we have water, H2O, that simply means that we have two hydrogen atoms bound to one oxygen atom. So that would be a water molecule. One of the interesting things um, about compounds is that a compound can have a very can have very different physical and chemical properties than the elements that make it up. And here are a couple examples of that. Think about water. Um, water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Well, both hydrogen and oxygen are gases at room temperature, and yet somehow when we bring them together, we get this liquid at room temperature. Um, another example is salt, so, which is sodium chloride, which means it's made up of sodium and chlorine atoms. Um, sodium is actually a metal that's solid at room temperature. Um, and chlorine is a poisonous gas. And yet, when these two combine, we get table salt. So compounds often have very different properties than the elements that form them. 